Today's text is a very interesting text. It's got a lot of different things going on in it. And then we get this story of these two sons where we get asked the question. But the main thrust of this text is about authority. And who has it and where it comes from, right? The Pharisees or the religious leaders ask Jesus the very first question which leads us into the next Three or four stories in this chapter and then into the following chapter. By what authority do you do these things? This question leads us into probably the next five weeks of sermons. By what authority do you do these things? And we can see in our text there's actually two places that authority comes from. One of them is heaven and the other is humans, right? We all know that, right? Some people have authority based upon their position, right? Kids, youth, if the principal tells you to do something, you do it. Why? Because he has, he or she has authority because of their position. Adults, if your boss tells you to do something, you do it because they have power based upon the position that they're in. It's given to them by us. Nothing that... Heaven did for them, but we place them into a position of authority because of who they are or the position that they hold. One of the commentators says about this difference in human and heavenly authority. First, there is human authority. No matter how sophisticatedly it is packaged, human authority is a matter of raw power. If you have enough people behind you or guns with you, you have it. And what you say goes, period. Divine authority, on the other hand has to do with truth, the truth of God, the truth about who God made us to be. In the short run, human authority can appear to overwhelm divine authority, even to crucify it. But ultimately, God's truth and authority will always prevail. So Jesus responds to their question, by what authority do you do these things? And he says, if you answer my question, I'll answer your question. And he asked them, John's baptism, where did it come from, heaven or earth? And what did they do? What did they do? They discussed amongst themselves. They talked about what was going to happen if we say it came from heaven, and then Jesus is going to say, well, why why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you get baptized? And if they say it didn't come from heaven, it came from humans, then the crowds are going to come against them because the crowds all think that John was a prophet, right? They worked it out. But here's the issue with all of this. They discussed it. They dialogued amongst themselves how they were going to answer Jesus' question. They knew what was going to happen. Either way. But they didn't ask God what they should do. Which tells us then their authority is from humans, right? Right. Their authority did not come from God because if their authority came from God, they would have to question God on what they needed to do next. But since they talked amongst themselves, they knew they had to figure this out for themselves. Because either way, they're going to lose faith, right? If they say it's from heaven, Jesus is going to question them. If they say it's from humans, the crowds are going to come against them. Either way, they lose faith. Either way, they lose authority in the face of people around them. Their concerns are about what other people are going to say about them indicates that their authority comes from the people around them, not from God. Another commentator makes this observation about this. Even though the chief priests and elders correctly view authority as something given to someone and not as an intrinsic part of someone's being, for them, once it has been received, this authority characterizes that person. Right? They ask Jesus, by what authority do you do these things? But for Jesus, authority, for them, Jesus has authority. And with it, he does certain things. By contrast, though, Jesus does not speak of John's authority. When he asked them the question, what question did he ask them? John's baptism. When, where did it come from? Right? He places the authority on the baptism of Jesus. In other words, the authority for Jesus is attached to the act, to what the person does, rather than to the person. The person does not have authority. What the person does, such as a baptism performed by John, is what is authoritative. 
Right? There's a difference there. Jesus didn't say, where did John's authority come from? Jesus asked them, where did the authority of John's baptism come from? Where did John's baptism come from? So what if Jesus had answered their question? And he said, my authority comes from God. What would the Pharisees have done? What? They would have flipped out. They probably would have laughed at him. They wouldn't have believed him. They would have just thought that he was crazy, right? And how many of us know that one person from our past? You know the person I'm talking about, the person that was always in trouble, the person that always did everything they could to have caused some kind of issue, to skirt the rules. Do you know the person? You don't have to. I don't want any names, but you all know the person I'm talking about, right? Some of us might have been that person, right? But now, things might have changed, right? I had a person like that from my past who is a Baptist pastor. I know that because he was a really good friend of mine and we used to do a lot of stuff together. So, <laughs> Those are people that can't change, right? When you see them, you're like, I know you and you're a troublemaker. So there's no way that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing now. Right? We all think that way for a while. We judge that person by what we knew, not by what they are now. We see them in the light of where they were, not in where they are. We see them before God, maybe not after God. See, sometimes we have a feeling that God can't do what we don't want Him to do. We get hung up on the fact that things need to happen the way that we think they need to happen. Or, to say it another way that I've heard way too many times, my faith is made up, don't confuse me with what God can do. Right? I know what I need to know. I know what the Bible says. Don't confuse me with what God is going to do in, in this place. And then the leaders respond to Jesus' question, right? Jesus asked them the question, where does John baptism come from? So they've talked amongst themselves and they answer Jesus. So they answer Jesus, we do not know. They chose the path of non-commitment, which ironically betrays their commitment to God. To not answer displays not genuine ignorance because we can see from the debate they have. They go back and forth, right? They know the consequences of either decision. So it's not an ignorant decision. They just don't want to commit. It shows that they are deliberately resisting what God is doing in that place at that time. In refusing to say that John's ministry comes from God, they reject the claim that John and Jesus have God-given authority. To refuse this recognition is to also reveal their illegitimacy. That the power that they have, that the authority that they have, comes from those around them who they yielded over, not from God. And here's the kicker to all of this. Each and every one of us here this morning have a God-given power and authority through the, through the fact that the Holy Spirit resides in each and every one of us. You have a God-given power and authority to go out into the world and do things that Jesus Himself didn't even do. It says that in the Bible. Jesus says, you will do greater things than I do. You have that power and authority within you. And we need to use it. Not with just words, but also through deeds. Which leads us to the story this morning. Matthew says that there are two sons. And in this parable, this parable is, in its own way, a narrative description of Jesus' earlier statement in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew has an emphasis on our doing something in the world, right? Deeds are more important than words. And on one level, this parable just addresses the difference between the church and the synagogue of Matthew's day, right? The tension between church and synagogue. The tension between those who said yes and those who were outsiders. Right? The synagogue were the people who had said yes to God, but they failed to go and do the work. Right? That first son said, no, I'm not going. The second one, though, is Jesus' representation of the synagogue. Yes, I'll go. No, I really don't want to do that because it's not going to help me anything. Right? I'm going to stay here and do what I want. They didn't go and do God's work. They were not doing God's will. And the church, according to the synagogue, especially the sinful Jesus and all of those Gentile converts that came along with him, were those who had originally said no to God, but then changed their minds after God worked in their lives. 
One of the works that Jesus calls us to is repentance. But those who are in the church, those who are self-righteous, don't see a need for repentance because they don't need to change their heart, their mind, or their behaviors because we're already part of the in crowd. Only sinners see a need for asking for forgiveness, for looking for a change, for having a change of heart, mind, or behavior. It's only those of us who recognize that, yes, we are saints, but we're also still sinners. So we have to ask for that forgiveness and seek out that repentance. On another level, though, it's not only just the separation of the church and the synagogue of Matthew's day. This story tells us that we need to be aware of what we're doing and what we're watching and what we're saying and where we're going and what we're doing. Right? This is a warning to the church that those of us who are inside who are now yes people, yes, Father, I will go, and we don't. Right? We could become the ones who say the right words but fail to act in, and do the things that God has called us to do. It's a parable and a warning for the people, for all people who sit in any of the pews that hear this story this morning. The question that comes from this is what does it mean to do the will of our Father? What does it mean to do the Father's will? When the parable here is asked to choose between the two sons, a dilemma arises. Which son is right? Which son is wrong? Because both sons have insulted the Father. One by saying no and the other by saying yes and doing nothing. But one comes to the family's aid by going into the vineyard and upholding the family's solidarity, while the other maintains the family's good name by appearing on the surface to be a good son. The question in first century, in Jesus' day, would not be which son was right. The question would be which son would the father be less mad at? Because both of them shamed the father. One of them by publicly saying no to him and the other by saying yes and then not doing anything. Neither one of the sons was correct. Even though the one changed his mind and later went, he's still not right. So which one of the sons is right? The one who said no, the one who said yes. Here's a couple more examples for you to chew on. Once there were two couples. Couple A were married in a large, beautiful church ceremony. They pledged lifelong faithfulness and love to each other and in, moving words, in the moving words of their vows. However, their lives together has been one of abuse, both physical and verbal, and they have both been very unfaithful to each other in their marital vows. Couple B lived together. They had no public ceremony. They signed no marriage license. They spoke no vows in the presence of any witnesses. However, their life together is a loving and affirming relationship, and they have always remained faithful to each other. Which couple is right? Which couple is in the wrong? Another example. Those who attend church and say all the right things, but whose lives failed and fall short of what John says is the way of righteousness. And others who live exemplary lives but want nothing to do with organized religion or their public expression of any kind of faith. Which one of them is right? Which one of them is wrong? Who, in all three of these stories, is doing the will of the Father? You see, the key to this parable is the word that is translated in our text to change one's mind. The younger son, or the first son, I should say, not the younger, I always assume he's the younger son, but the first son, the father goes to him and says, go to my field, and he says, no. But then later on he had a change of mind, and he went. See, this word for change of mind is metamelomai in the Greek. Y'all are going to be able to speak Biblical Greek in about three years here. So, metamelomai is the word. And it's actually used again at the end of our reading in verse 32 when, it, when Jesus says to the Pharisees about changing their minds. You didn't see and change your mind. Right? Metamelomai is the word here. It's used in, that, in the most literal understanding of this word is not to change one's mind. Usually, the idea of changing one's mind or repentance is used by the word metanoi, 
metanoi is the word that we use for repent. Remember we talked about repent before. Repent is changing your mind, turning around. Repentance is a physical action turning back to God. But that's not the word we have here. It's not to change your mind. And here's where it gets really interesting. The prefix for meta means to change, right? That's clear. Meta is change. Nomai is related to the activities of the mind. Nomus. It's the repentance, the turn around. The verb mellow, though, that the other word comes from, that has a sense of to care for. So we might translate metalomai as changing what one cares about or to change what one is most concerned about. I would rather see verse 29 in our readings to be translated as, He answered, he, ans- he, he answering said, I am not willing, but later having a change of heart, he went. We could say that as the exact same thing of the religious leaders later in verse 32. They could not change their hearts, or, to quote God from the Old Testament, their hearts were hardened. They couldn't possibly see things in another way. Because you see, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. And if we can't believe, we can't see, or what we see will not help us understand what it is that we should actually be seeing. But what is it that they should have seen, these Pharisees? The first answer is that they should have seen the life of John, who came in a way of righteousness, which implies more than just hearing what he said, but also seeing what he did. Changing people's lives. Were his actions authoritative? Yes, absolutely. Did his actions evoke repentance and faith in many people? Many people came from everywhere to John and the River Jordan to get baptized because they heard what he was doing and they wanted to change life. The second answer of what these Pharisees should have seen is they should have seen the change in the lives of the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Do we actually believe God can turn lives around of such obvious sinners? Remember that person I asked you about earlier? That person had always got into trouble? Have you seen them lately? Are they a different person now? But it's still sometimes hard for us to see them in a completely new light because it's hard for us to see people from what we remember or what we know them as. Right? We tend to approach such dramatic conversions with a lot of skepticism. Might that also imply that we are likely to close ourselves off from the transforming power of God ourselves? Are we unable to change our hearts? Are we content with our relatively comfortable lives We don't want God coming in and messing up all that we have by calling us to new and different concerns to care about. I've got to take care of myself here, God. I don't need all these other things to take care of. Right? Could it also be that we don't want God messing up our congregations by having sinners coming into our comfortable relationships? Right? We don't want those people here because they're going to mess up our perfect little place. And news for you. We're all sinners. None of us are perfect. That's why we're here. This is not a place for the perfect. This is a place for the sick. Churches are not places for those who have it all together. Churches are places for those of us who are trying to get it all together and walk after God and live that life. Right? I'm certain there are many people here this morning who've had a powerful life-changing experience with God. Somebody in this room has had one. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to share it, because in sharing it, you would have to divulge some things about your past that would probably make people look at you in a different way. Not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong. But would you be willing to come forward and share your story? I'm not asking you to. Think about it. Would you be willing to share a story of a powerful experience that you had with God that changed your life in such a dramatic way? Would you be willing to reveal a sinful past that had to call you into that experience with God? Would you still be accepted by others sitting next to you if they knew what it was that you did? And if somebody was willing and strong enough to come up here and stand and tell us that story, would we be willing to believe them? Right? It's not about authority. I said this text was about authority. I lied to you. It is about authority, but it's also about change. You see, it's about us being open and our hearts being available to God. 
Mark Allen Powell shares a story in, in the book Chasing the Eastern Star. I remember a seminar I attended in college. A large African-American man had two big signs up in front. One read, Jesus Christ accepts you the way you are. The other said, Jesus Christ will change your life. Both are biblical and both are good news, the speaker affirmed. So why is it that you Lutherans equate the gospel with one sign and not the other? You say, Jesus will change my life. Well, that's nice. But the really good news is that he accepts me the way that I am. You get so excited that Jesus will accept you as you are, that after a while some of you begin to wonder whether this isn't just because you plan to stay the way you are, whether Jesus will change you or not. Now, where I come from in the inner city, I know some folks who, if you tell them Jesus accepts you the way you are, will respond, well, that's nice of him. But the fact is, I really don't like being the way I am. My life isn't so good. It's just, it's nice that Jesus loves me even though I'm poor and hungry and my life is a mess. But you know what, would, what some really good news would be? Really good news would be if he'd change my life so I don't have to stay this way. Do we believe that the God who gives us this story is powerful enough to change our lives and the lives of people around us? Do you believe that God is powerful enough to change your life? Will you believe it when sinners testify to the ways God has changed their lives, hearts, and minds, and behaviors? The primary point of this parable is about having a change of heart. Not just about saying the right things or doing the right things. Neither of the sons were right in what they did. Even though one of them changed and went what he was supposed to do, he still wasn't right for saying no. And neither of the couples were right. Both of them need change of hearts. Couple A in the way that they act towards each other and couple B in the fact that they need to share that relationship with the world and have a public announcement of their vows. And neither people from the third story are right. The believers that come and sit and do all the right and say all the right things but don't do anything or the person who's out there living out a life of faith in the service that they do to the world but not acknowledging it in the realm of a, of a religious setting. Everyone needs a change of heart. We all need that change of heart. Every last one of us. I recently saw a picture on Facebook, and I'm sure some of you saw it too. It's a cartoon of a little boy in a football uniform going up to his coach and saying, Coach, I'm sorry I can't be at the game this Sunday because I have to acolyte at church. I saw it in several different places, but I saw it in one of the closed groups that I'm a part of, of other leaders in the church. And the comments on that I thought were very interesting. The responses that I saw from other leaders in the church was, yeah, right, it'll never happen. Somebody is really dreaming here. These people need to wake up and smell the coffee, right? It's not going to happen. Can we expect God to cause such a change in our attitude that we can believe that he's powerful enough to do things that we don't expect him to do. As long as we hold the attitudes of the people that posted on Facebook, no. As long as we hold the attitudes of this is the way it's always been and this is the way it's always going to be because this is the way that I've seen it happen that leaves no room for God to come in to soften our hearts, to change us into the way and show us the route that he's given in front of us, to put us on the path to the mission that he's called us to. If we cannot be open and allow our hearts to be molded by God, it's not going to change. But as soon as we open ourselves up and allow God in, he's going to take over and the most radical things are going to happen and our lives are going to blossom and things are going to just explode because we've submitted ourselves to the awesome power of a God who loves us enough to send His only Son so that each and every one of us can be accepted by Him in a relationship, a personal relationship. So open yourselves up to allow Him to set you on fire and make you a blazing beacon of His hope that will show all of this world the authority of Jesus and the love that all of us can have because of that authority. Open your hearts and allow Him to wonderfully fill you with the authority of the Holy Spirit to send you forward in His power, to send you out into this world to do things even greater than Jesus did, to show everybody the love that God has for you and the power and authority that He's given you and that he will also give to them if we can just leave ourselves and our hearts 
open to what he's calling us to do.